Uh, 3D ultrasound uh, really has been around for a while, really since the 1980s, but it didn't really uh, fi found its way in clinical practice until the computing power became such that the post-processing of the image really became of such speed that we could see it almost instant instantaneously. Of all the applications in OBGYN with 3D ultrasound, I think in gynecology is where 3D ultrasound has been most useful. And it's been most useful because of the ability of 3D ultrasound to really display the coronal plane of the uterus. So, and the first time really we are able to see the coronal plane of the uterus. And if you look at the, all the anatomy, how we studied uh, the anatomy of the uterus, we've really looked at the coronal plane and how the coronal plane was displayed. And now 3D ultrasound allows us to see the coronal plane what that means that it allows us to really make very specific diagnosis of malarian abnormalities. And before that, we used to resort to other alternate imaging, such as magnetic resonance imaging, MRIs, to get those diagnoses. And now at the bedside, and instantaneously within seconds, we can display the coronal plane of the uterus and make these specific diagnoses at a much cheaper cost, much less discomfort for the patient, and certainly with more accuracy, at least equal accuracy as MRI, as MRI is. So biggest advantage of 3D ultrasound, in my opinion, is unequivocally the ability to display the coronal plane of the uterus, which allows you to make all the specific diagnoses with regards to malaria and abnormalities, but also patients who have uh, IUDs that are lost, you can actually localize the IUD uh, uh, very accurately within the urine cavity or outside. And there are some applications related to the adnexa. They're a little bit less specific, especially, I believe, in categorizing the hydrosalpings. Because the hydrosalpings is a tube, is the, is the, is the tube that's filled with water. When the tube is folded uh, along itself, it looks on the 2D plane like a multicystic mass. And many women have had surgery you know, especially in the postmenopausal uh, time, for uh, what looks like a multiseptated mass on ultrasound to find that it's a hydrosalpinx. Now, if you get a volume of the adnexa and you reconstruct that volume using some sophisticated algorithm, such as an inverse mode, which converts anything that's, that's bright, dark, and anything that's dark and bright, you can reconstruct that tube and you can actually show that this multiseptated mass is actually a tube and you can avoid unnecessary surgery on many women. So the three indications that I would say in gynecology is by far initially the malarian anomalies making the diagnosis, two, localizing the IUD in symptomatic patients, and three, select cases in adnexal pathology, especially with hydrosalpingies. And in that setting, because today uh, uh, ultrasound, 3D ultrasound has been denied by insurance company, which has really limited its clinical applicability. We assembled a task force from the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine to really write the current status of the literature on 3D ultrasound and gynecology. And the paper was published in the Journal of Ultrasound and Medicine within the last three months. And we are going to use this paper really to push for insurance companies to reimburse 3D ultrasound in those specific applications. With healthcare changes and trying to really limit uh, expenditures in healthcare, one of the biggest expenditures in healthcare is imaging. Imaging accounts for a huge chunk of healthcare expenditures. And it's not really ultrasound that accounts for that, it's CT and MR that accounts for these big imaging. And one area that we know where we can make a dent is in MR where we have an ultrasound that is equivalent. And that's a big area that I focused on when I was uh, the president of the AIUM, I focused on an initiative called Ultrasound First. We're thinking about doing ultrasound, not only in OBGYN, but in all other specialties, where ultrasound has shown to be at least equally effective as other imaging modalities, is thinking about doing ultrasound first, because it is safe, it is effective, and it's affordable. And, and I see in gynecology, ultrasound playing a bigger role in the future, both in 2D and 3D. I get many patients sent to me today for just 2D ultrasound, when for adnexal masses, and I look at their history, and they've had one or two CT scans before for adnexal pathology, and then I do an ultrasound, and they have a hemorrhagic cyst, and the patient goes home without not needing anything else. 
Now there's a big area that's evolving, which is the use of 3D ultrasound and looking at the perineum, mm -hmm. especially in your looking at the urogenital diaphragm and looking at some. It's an area that's a bit controversial with regards to the clinical implications, but we're using it to identify slings that that sometimes where is the location of the sling that is uh, you can't tell clinically or by the traditional ultrasound. 3D ultrasound allows you to get the coronal plane of the urogenital diaphragm and the pelvis and you can actually see the slings very clearly in its location. There's a lot of work ongoing on diagnosing enteroceles and cystoceles and so forth using 3D ultrasound of the pelvis because the value of it, not only that you can get the coronal plane, but you can do dynamic studies. So you can actually do motion as part of that and see with real-time 3D, which is 4D ultrasound, see the urethroceal coming and the enteroceal coming, and that can assess the mobility of the, of the pelvis. So the traditional vaginal probe that we have finds from the end, right? It's an end firing. Some of the some of the urogenital probe actually are top firing, meaning they fire from the dorsal aspect of the probe. So they fire straight up into the urogenital. But you can do almost everything that you need to do with the standard vaginal probe that you put about a centimeter into the introitus. Or you can get the abdominal 3D probe and put it on the perineum and get the, the, the 3D volumes through the probe straight up. And then patients can Valsalva, you can see the mobility, hypermobility of the urethra. You can see all these changes that now the, the urogynecologists look for in assessing you know, pathology in the urogenital diaphragm. So I get a 3D ultrasound of the uterus every time I scan the uterus. And I do that because I'm there, the transducer is there, and I like to look at the uterus to see what I see. I don't bill, well, we don't get reimbursed now, but, but, uh, but I attempt to bill for these specific indications that I mentioned. But I get it on every patient for the many reasons that, first of all, I would like to look at the uterus. I think the, I'm, I'm there already, and, uh, and it takes no, it takes five extra seconds to look. Actually, some of the ultrasound equipment have built in the coronal plane. All you have to do is go into the 3D and get the, the line to put it on the middle of the uterus and displays the coronal plane in parallel to the 2D image. So you don't have to even acquire a volume and manipulate a volume. So I do it routinely and I encourage my sonographers to do it routinely so they can acquire the expertise in doing it when they really need to do it on a patient with an indication. And that's the difficulty when we put the task force together, the actual acquisition and display of the 3D volume actually is not a difficult thing to, to do. We did a study several years back in our community. I invited all the private physicians that have some expertise in 2D ultrasound, they do in their office. And, and we put them in one room and we gave them 10 minutes. This is at the time when 3D ultrasound was still coming out gave them a 10 minutes discussion about what 3D ultrasound is, what's the X, Y, and Z planes. And then we divided them in half and we taught half of them what we call the Z technique, which we reported on. It's how to display the coronal plane of the uterus by doing rotation along the Z axis in X, Y, and Z planes. And the other half we did not. And then we gave them volumes, we put them on our machines and we gave them volumes and we said, go ahead and play with the rotations and see if you can get the coronal plane. We found, first of all, that both of them were able to get the coronal plane within five minutes if you, if you let them play with the volumes. But then the ones we taught, the, the Z technique, within, I think, 100 seconds, they were able to bring the coronal plane of the uterus every single time. These are gynecologists that they have sonographers in their office, so they're not really themselves scanning. So it's easy to learn, it's easy to understand the concept how to get the coronal plane because it's a fixed volume. It's not like obstetrics. Obstetrics 3D manipulation especially in fetal echo or others, it's very difficult because the heart is such a complicated mm. structure. But in gynecology, it's easier to learn. But the difficulty with comes together is how to interpret the images once you have them. How do you make the difference between a bicornuit and a didelphus uterus? And how do you need to acquire sometimes different volumes because you need to get the volume of the lower segment and a volume of the, of the fundus because they may be in different planes 
you may not be able to get. So there's a little bit of, of experience that comes with to make the ultimate diagnosis, you need some expertise. So when we put the task force together, one of the discussions we had internally is, is, there, is the access available to have, when we say ultrasound is great, there's no question the technology is great to make this diagnosis, but there's, is there enough expertise available to make these diagnoses every single time? And it's, there needs to be some education and training to really reach that level. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of work that is ongoing, but the biggest impact I believe that 2D and 3D ultrasound would have in the future is in reducing costs in healthcare.